The sudden death of Pope Paul captured the headlines all over the world this past week. Pope Paul presided over the Roman Catholic Church when he was going through one of the most critical periods in its history. In one sense, he witnessed a revolution within the Roman Catholic world that has been developing for several decades. In another sense, he sought to give that revolution direction and guidance. I've heard from some who knew him personally that he was deeply burdened about the perils he saw facing both the church and the world. Many of his public statements showed a genuine concern for evangelism. His statements were also frequently marked by a strong Christ-centered emphasis. He will be remembered, however, for his hard and constant work for peace. The Roman Catholic Church and the world now await the elevation of a new pope and wonder what direction his administration will take in a world that seems to be moving from crisis to crisis so rapidly at the present moment. Two weeks from today, we begin the Mid-America Crusade in the Kemper Arena in Kansas City. There have been careful preparations and prayers on the parts of hundreds of churches, and already there's been enormous interest in the crusade meetings. As we go to Kansas City, we covet your prayers. In some ways, this will not be an easy crusade. For example, we're coming to Kansas City the week before Labor Day, when many of the people are normally on vacation. But God is able to overcome, and we're trusting Him for His blessing. There is power in the Word of God. We are convinced that God has led us to Kansas City at this particular time, and we look to Him to pour out His Spirit and bring many people to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. As we go to Kansas City, we will be proclaiming the same message we've proclaimed on every continent, the message that men can be born again through the saving knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. On every hand, in our newspapers, on the radio, and on our television screens, for the past two years, we've been hearing the term born again. And even news magazines have devoted whole stories to the subject. People have been asking, what does this term really mean? What is the new birth? Last week, I read about a born again baseball team. It has been a political term, a sports term, an entertainment term. Last year, I wrote a book entitled How to Be Born Again to try to explain exactly what it means what the Bible teaches about the new birth. I've devoted many sermons to this important subject and have been asked many times by mail to explain how the new birth comes to a person. The term born again is an expression that was used by the Lord Jesus Christ, and it means a renewal or regeneration of our spiritual natures. Man is a spiritual being. He is made in the image of God. And in fact, this is the most fundamental and distinctive thing about man. This is what makes him different from the angels or from the animals or from any other creatures in the universe. Man is made in God's image. But the Bible tells us something has happened to that spiritual image. We were created in the image of God, but sin entered the world and defaced that image. We were meant to live for God but we've become self-centered and we live for ourselves. That's the reason we have wars and rumors of wars. And that's why Christ could accurately predict that there would be wars and rumors of wars till the end of time because he knew that human nature was not going to be changed except on the part of a minority in generation after generation that would come to believe on him and be born again. He knew that human nature by and large was going to continue and that as long as human nature is as it is, man was going to fight. When we are born again, God forgives us our sins. He touches our lives and begins to restore our spiritual natures. In a real sense, spiritual rebirth is radical, just as natural birth is radical. It's revolutionary. It is the beginning of a whole new way of life. And because we've been born again, we know we will be with God throughout eternity in heaven. We also know that down here, while we're still in our bodies, we will be indwelt by the Holy Spirit who will guide and lead and direct us in our way. How does the new birth take place in our lives? First, we must admit our failure to all that God wants us to be. We must confess and admit that we are sinners. We've broken God's laws. We've come short of His glory. 
And that's often very hard for people to do because our pride gets in the way. We know that we may be good in the eyes of other people and we may have been faithful in many of the responsibilities we have in life. But the important thing is, how does God see us? Can I honestly say that I've done everything God has wanted me to do all the days of my life? I have to answer no. I'm a sinner. I'm a lawbreaker. I've rebelled against God. I need forgiveness. I need regeneration. I need the new birth. No one listening to my voice today can claim perfection. I think sometimes people feel that God will simply weigh all of our good deeds against our bad deeds, or that maybe he is a kindly and benevolent being who simply chuckles at our mistakes. But the Bible does not say these things about God. The Bible teaches that he is holy and that a holy God is going to judge the world. And even our thoughts and intents as well as our words and actions are going to be held against us on the day of judgment. And that includes the whole human race from Adam to you and me at this moment. The second step in experiencing the new birth is to understand what God has done to deal with our spiritual problem of sin. God loves us in spite of our sins, and he does not want us to live apart from him. If we're sinful and cannot save ourselves by our good works, who can save us? Only God can. And this is why Jesus Christ came into the world. I know there's much about this that our limited minds cannot fully understand, but God sent his son into the world to make a spiritual rebirth possible. I do not deserve anything from God except his judgment, but Jesus Christ, the Son of God, took that judgment that I deserve upon himself by dying on the cross for me. And God raised him from the dead. And the very fact that Jesus Christ is a living Christ is proof that God has accepted his atoning work on the cross. And because God has accepted his atoning work on the cross, I am scot-free. My sins are forgiven. I've been justified. The Bible says that by simple trust and faith in Christ and what he has done, we can be saved. We can be born again. When I turn my life over to Christ, God takes it. God begins to remake it. I've been born again. There's a further step in coming to a new spiritual birth. We need to realize just what God expects of us when we come to faith in Jesus Christ and are born again. A newborn infant has a whole new life ahead of him, and the same is true of us. Everything we are and everything we do and everything we have is no longer for ourselves, but for Christ. This is what is meant by discipleship. We turn from anything in our lives that is displeasing to God, and we seek to live as he would have us live. We want his will only in our lives from this moment on. We live under the lordship of Jesus Christ. And in discipleship, we read the word, we pray, we love our families, we love our neighbors, we grow in the grace and knowledge of Christ, and then we become disciples. We march on toward maturity, and that full maturity will not come until we get to heaven, but we are becoming formed in the image of Christ day by day. This does not mean that we must be perfect because we are never perfect this side of eternity. Nor does it mean that we live for God only in our own strength. God gives us strength to live as he would have us to live. That's the reason the Holy Spirit lives in us. I cannot say what it would mean specifically for you if you begin to follow Christ without reservation. Only God can reveal that to you as you are open to God's leading. The point I'm making is that we cannot be the same once God has touched us and we have been reborn spiritually. We're all different. We've been given different gifts by the Holy Spirit, and no two people have exactly the same experience. But I do know that if you surrender every area of your being to Christ, you can become his disciple, and there will be a peace and a joy in your life that words cannot explain. There's another step, and that is actual commitment to the Lord Jesus Christ as Lord. The Bible uses several ways to help us see what this means. For example, it speaks of Jesus Christ and his salvation as a gift. In ordinary life, we know that a gift is something that someone else has paid for. And when it is offered to us, we can have it simply by accepting it. 
It is the same way that God's offer of salvation. God has done everything possible to bring about our salvation by sending his son into the world to die for our sins. But that gift only becomes ours when we accept it by inviting Jesus Christ into our lives. And we don't invite him into our lives just as Savior. We invite him as Lord. Every area of our life, our family, our business, everything comes under the Lordship of Christ so that almost minute by minute you are walking in God's way according to God's will and saying to the Lord every moment, Lord, thy will be done. God stands ready to receive us. And all we have to do is to turn to him in simple faith, but there is more, and that is the Lordship of Jesus Christ. Do you know him as Savior, and do you know him as Lord? Have you been born again, and then after being born again, are you walking with him in discipleship? All across the world, I've seen people of all kinds of backgrounds turn to Christ and accept him with a simple prayer of confession and faith. If you're uncertain that you have never been born again, I ask you to consider this matter seriously right now and invite Christ into your life as Savior and as Lord. I've just come from a funeral in which the man that we were burying had said in his last moment, he pointed upward and he said, I'm ready to meet God. Can you say that? Can you say that I'm ready to meet God and point upward if this should be your last day upon earth? In the silence of your own heart, I'm going to ask you to pray this prayer with me. Oh God, I acknowledge that I've sinned against you. I'm sorry for my sins. I'm willing to turn from my sins. I openly receive and acknowledge Jesus Christ is my Savior. I confess him as Lord. From this moment on, I want to follow him in discipleship. I want to live for him. I want to serve him in the fellowship of his church. In Jesus' name, amen. Did you pray that prayer with me? I believe that if you prayed that prayer in sincerity, you have been heard by God and have been born again. I believe this because God has promised in his word that him that cometh to me, I will in no wise cast out and that he will never leave you nor forsake you. Shall we pray? Our Father and our God, we thank thee that it's possible for us to be born again to start all over, to start new, to become new creations, to have the past forgiven, wiped out, and forgotten by God, and to have our names written on the book of life and know that we're going to heaven. We pray that many this day that have listened to this message may be born again right now, for we ask it in his name. Amen.